I am presenting Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number 5, Sunday, December 31st, 2023. Happy New Year. The lesson is entitled Chosen in Christ. Lesson text comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Related scriptures are Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 38. Romans 8, 28 through 30, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17. The place is from Rome. The time is 60 AD. Everything in the world around us today seems uncertain. Political, economic, and even some religious forces look threatening to both our physical and spiritual lives. Where can we find stability, security, and even victory? Our first unit this quarter examines the bedrock spiritual truth about our position in Jesus Christ as our Savior through him. Today's aim, facts, to realize what God has said and done about our spiritual security in Christ. Principle, to understand that God clearly tells us that our spiritual position in Christ comes from him, not from us. He is our only hope for salvation, and our lives are going to be to the praise of his glory. Application. To show that resting in God's word is the answer to the big questions of life and eternity. Illustrating the lesson. God has chosen and claimed you. Practical point. One. Our relationship with Christ is not only a daily experience, but also an eternal one. Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. 2. We should never take for granted either God's acceptance of our relationship with him. Verses 5 through 6. 3. Everything that God does for us is based on what and who he is, not on who we are. Verses 7 through 8. 4. Christ is the central figure of the ages, as well as of our lives, verses 9 through 10. 5. We must always live in a manner worthy of our position as God's children and heirs, verses 11 through 12. 6. God's gift of the Holy Spirit is just one of his many provisions for us, verses 13 through 14. Golden text. God predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Ephesians 1, 5 through 6. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is God's past actions. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. The second is our present reality, Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. The third is our future existence, Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Introduction. When Peter was writing his second epistle, he referred to the coming of the day of the Lord, 2 Peter 3, 10. He followed this with a challenge to live holy and godly lives in light of this approaching time, verse 11. In concluding his challenge, he made an insightful statement regarding the writings of the Apostle Paul. Our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, have written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction, verses 15 through 16. In spite of the fact that Peter was a man of great spiritual depth, he saw some of Paul's writings as difficult to comprehend. That should encourage us when we find them so. Paul's sentences can sometimes be quite complex, but it is worth the effort to seek to understand his meaning. God's past action. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4. 
according as he have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5. <clears throat> Having, be pre having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he have made us accepted in the beloved. He chose us, Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. Paul began by saying that God is to be blessed because he has blessed us with many spiritual blessings. God is worthy of adoration because he has conferred rich blessings on us and given us many spiritual benefits. Paul described God as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and declared that our blessings come to us from heaven because of Christ. These benefits are nothing that we either earn or deserve. They are ours because of our relationship with God's Son, Jesus Christ. Paul enumerated the spiritual blessings he had in mind, beginning with the truth that God chose us. God did this choosing in and through his Son, even before the physical creation. This immediately raises a question that has been debated by theologians for centuries. How do we reconcile the truths presented in the Bible about God's sovereignty with mankind's free will? Ephesians 1.4 clearly states that God sovereignly chooses those who are to be his. Other scriptures say God calls individuals to repent, but only some obey. Luke 7.30, 8.10, 13.34, 14.16, 16 through 20. For example, 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6 says that God wants everyone to be saved. Hebrews 2, 9 states that Jesus tasted death for everyone. And 1 John 2, 2 describes Christ as the propitiation for the entire world. Yet we still have the statement in Ephesians 1, 4 that God chose us. It is one of those great spiritual blessings Paul included in his list of blessings. How thankful we should be that we have been included in God's plan. The Bible teaches that God is sovereign. It also teaches that people can make choices. If you try to merge the two ideas, you will distort truth. If you try to remove all tension between the two, you will destroy one or the other of the truths, and possibly both. They appear mutually exclusive to us because of a limitation either to our information or intelligence or both. The two truths are not mutually exclusive to God. The truths of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility to choose him are an antinami, a seeming contradiction between two equally valid truths that are held simultaneously. God's infinite wisdom does not communicate all he knows and understands to his finite creatures, but everything he does communicate is the truth. He adopted us, Ephesians 1, 5 through 6. Verse 4 concludes with the purpose and result of God's selection of us. We are to be holy and blameless in our Christian lives. That means we must faithfully confess our sins and remain sensitive to the works, to the Spirit's work within us. This is important because we have been adopted as the children of God and are not to live our lives as if our comfort were the chief aim. Part of God's choosing is that he predetermines that we should be placed into a family that is naturally ours, namely his own. It is helpful to look at how adoption worked in the Roman world in which Paul lived. The adopted person suddenly had all the rights of a legitimate son or daughter and was totally disconnected from his or her previous family relationships. Life was now new. All old debts and obligations were canceled as if they had never existed. The new position of an adopted child meant that the person enjoyed every privilege of a natural born child enjoyed. 
of course he was expected to live in a manner worthy of his new position. God adopts into his family every person who receives Jesus Christ as personal Savior. He gives them all the privileges of being his children. We do not have to grow into or earn those privileges. They are ours from the moment of salvation. Even more astounding is the fact that all of this is ours because he enjoys giving it to us. It is according to his pleasure and his will. It simply makes God happy to give us the joy of being his children. This should be an incentive to us to us to soberly accept our responsibilities along with our blessings. The ultimate purpose of God's plan to choose us, save us, and adopt us is his own glory. We have nothing of which to feel proud. Everything we have is because of the grace of God, and he is to receive all the glory. The word beloved in verse 6 refers to Christ. This means that we who are hopeless sinners are accepted and blessed, not because we are worthy, but because we are in Christ, the beloved one of God. Our present reality, verse 7, in whom we are in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, verse 10, that in his disposition of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The riches of his grace, Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. A pawnbroker is a person who loans money and holds a person's possessions until they are redeemed. That means the owner can recover his ownership only by paying a specified amount of money to the pawnbroker. Paul said we are redeemed from our sinful condition by the payment of Jesus' blood. As a result, we receive forgiveness of our sins. The Greek word translated redemption suggests a release from captivity. The purchase brings liberty. This is an illustration of the fact that we are slaves to sin prior to salvation. Since God created us, we are his. Even though in Adam we became his enemies, Romans 5, 8 through 12. In his love and mercy, however, he paid the price to buy us back in order to set us free from the slavery of sin. That means we are free from the eternal penalty of sin, hell and from the enslaving power of sin since we have within us the presence and power of the holy spirit we do not have to live in sin if we do live in sin we show no fruits of redemption we should not overlook the significance of our forgiveness forgiveness goes hand in hand with redemption we cannot have one without the other to forgive means to give up the right to punish someone for a transgression. Making forgiveness possible was a major accomplishment in God's eyes, since it required the sacrifice of God, and sacrifice of blood, and the death of his son Jesus. This magnanimous decision to do this for us grew out of God's grace, which he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. God has given all these blessings to us abundantly, according to the riches of his own grace. He also included the wisdom and understanding we need to comprehend it. There is much that is still beyond our comprehension, but God has allowed us to know enough to make it a source of great joy and deep appreciation for us. The mystery of his will, Ephesians 1, 9-10. Another thing God was pleased to show us is what Paul referred to as the mystery of his will. A mystery is, is necessarily puzzling. It indicates there are obscure realities that await discovery. 
But when Paul spoke of a mystery, he was referring to spiritual truth that previously had been hidden from mankind, but that now was being made known through revelation. In Romans 16, 25 through 26, Paul spoke of the gospel message he was delivering as a mystery. It included the complete plan of salvation. In Ephesians 3, 1 through 6, Paul explained the mystery that Gentiles were to be included in the privilege of receiving Christ into their lives. He gave a detailed explanation of this in 2, 14 through 16. For Christ is our peace, who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby. The mystery Paul spoke of in today's text is the truth that at the proper time, God would gather everything together under the authority of his son. We know that after Jesus resurrected from the dead, he clearly stated, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Matthew 28, 18. The apostle Paul emphasized that Christ would reign until all his enemies are subdued, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. We will see a partial picture of this in the millennium when Jesus will be the ruler of earth from his throne in Jerusalem. The complete fulfillment of this mystery, however, will come at the end of time and at the beginning of eternity. Ever since sin entered God's universe, destruction and division have reigned. Warren Worsby observed, sin is tearing everything apart. But in Christ, God will gather everything together in the culmination of the ages. We are a part of this great eternal program. Our future existence. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Verse 12 that we should be the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, verse 13, in whom also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise of his glory and inheritance, Ephesians 1, 11 through 12. From a first reading of these verses, we might get the impression that Paul was focusing mainly on the heavenly inheritance that we gain from our relationship with God through Jesus. This might be what Paul had in mind in Colossians 1, 12, where he stated, giving thanks unto the Father which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. But most likely we should not limit this to heaven, but rather include all the spiritual blessings we receive by being the children of God in Christ. In his commentary on the epistle of the Ephesians, Charles Hodge wrote, as the Israelites of old obtained an inheritance in the promised land, so those in Christ became partakers of that heavenly inheritance which he has secured for them. The Greek text, however, allows for more than one translation in this case. So there is a difference of opinion as to, ex as to the exact meaning of this phrase. The King James Version reads, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, but in whom also we were made an inheritance is also a possible translation. Both are true, and the one includes the other. In Christ we have a wonderful inheritance, 1 Peter 1, 1 through 5. And in Christ we are an inheritance. We are valuable to him. Think of the price God paid to purchase us and make us part of his inheritance. God the Son is the Father's love gift to us, and we are the Father's love gift to his Son. To think that 
God, in the counsel of his own will, determined to make us his, his inheritance is indeed a humbling realization. Jesus himself is desirous of our presence in heaven with him. Father, I will that they also whom thou has given me be with me where I am, John 17, 24. Our being part of the heavenly crowd redounds to the praise of the glory of Jesus. A guarantee, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. The pronoun you, ye, here designates the Gentiles as opposed to the Jews who were the we in verses 11 through 12. Chapter 2, verses 11 through 20. Three statements described what had happened to them in their salvation. First, they heard 1 through 13. First, they heard 1 13. What was given to them was the word of truth, that is, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, also called the gospel. This was referred to in verse 7 in the mention of redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sin that comes from redemption. Romans 10, 13 through 14 and 17 tells us that the only way to become believer is by hearing and responding to the saving truth found in God's word. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This explains what the Ephesian believers had heard. The second statement of Ephesians 1.13 is that they believed. It is not enough to hear about the possibility of salvation. There must be a response. It must be a response of belief in who Jesus is and what he has done to provide salvation. Third, they were sealed. This sealing is a guarantee of our salvation. It was done by with the Holy Spirit. Now, he which establishes us with you in Christ and have anointed us is God, who have also sealed us and given, given the earnest, earnest, of the spirit of our hearts. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. The word earnest means a pledge of our guarantee of something. Our ultimate salvation is described as the redemption of the purchased possession. Ephesians 1, 14. The presence of the Holy Spirit within us is a pledge that one day we will indeed be in heaven in the presence of God. We have been bought, redeemed with the price of Jesus' blood, and it will result in praise to his glory when we are forever with him. Questions 1. What was the first spiritual blessing from God to his children that Paul mentioned? 2. What is an antinomy, and what two truths in Scripture fits this description? 3. What took place in Roman adoption and how does it illustrate our adoption by God? 4. What is the meaning of redemption and what are the results of our having been redeemed? 5. What was God's motive in giving all these blessings into his own? 6. What is a biblical mystery? 7. What mystery did Paul mention in this week's text? And when will this mystery be fulfilled? 8. What does our inheritance in Christ include? 9. What is it that redounds to the praise of the glory of Jesus? 10. What does the presence of the Holy Spirit guarantee within us? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, December 31st, 2023. Thank you for listening. God bless.